Good morning, DrupalCon! Hey, everybody. Welcome to Los Angeles. Uh, oh, I almost forgot. I'm Holly Ross. And, oh, thanks. <laughs> I'm the executive director of the Drupal Association, and we're so glad to have all of you here. And before we kick things off, I do want to say uh, a huge special thanks to folks in the room who are helping us make Drupal 8 happen, because, of course, that's one of the biggest parts of what's happening in our community right now. So if you have made a donation to the Drupal 8 Accelerate campaign, could you just stand up for a second? Thank you so much. These guys have helped us fund the work of getting our last release blockers out of the way. And if you can do the same thing today, if you go to uh, Drupal, the, sorry, association.drupal.org, you can get details about how to donate. But more importantly, how many of you guys have a patch in Drupal 8 core? Can you stand up? Way to go, you guys. Thank you for literally making Drupal 8 happen. <laughs> That's amazing. Awesome. Well, I'm here uh, to represent the association, uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about our mission. The first part of our mission is this. Drupal powers the best of the web. True story, right? <laughs> and our job at the association is to unite this global community that builds and promotes Drupal. That's our job. And really, what that means is that we recognize that you power Drupal, so it's our job to empower you. We do that in a number of ways. We help grow and sustain the community. What we hear all the time is for, for folks who are new to Drupal, and, and how many of you here are at a DrupalCon for the first time? Awesome, welcome. Welcome. So we hear all the time that, you know, getting into the Drupal community is actually somewhat difficult. It's hard to get behind the velvet ropes and understand how to get engaged. So that's part of our job, is to help you guys figure that out. Uh, anyone come to the first time attendee social last night? Awesome. We're going to help you do that at Drupal Cons by helping to orient you to what happens here at the con. But we do that also on Drupal.org, the home of the community. Uh, you'll notice we have new profile pictures. This gentleman's very snazzy. Um, and we get to do things like, Mark, um, you know, this is someone who's new to the community, so maybe go easy on the lingo, right, uh, with that person. Uh, what's that? Oh, let's see slides. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, so we're, we're helping to tell people, you know, be nice to new folks, right? And we're confirming folks who are part, you know, confirming that they're not spam bots, but they're real actual people that gives them superpowers on Drupal.org. So we do it in the, at the cons, we do it in the community. Uh, we also want to make sure that um, Drupal jobs get filled, right? That we help developers find not just a great community, but also a means of employment with Drupal. So we have jobs.drupal.org. Um, and we also hear from folks, I want to get engaged in my local community, and I want to help organize my local Drupal developers. So we have camp kits and fiscal sponsorship. We have a new community organizer newsletter. And if you haven't seen, we have community cultivation grants. So if you want to get a new camp, uh, a new meetup, a new Drupal users group going in your area, check that out on association.drupal.org. So we grow and sustain the community, but we're also looking to help increase Drupal adoption. So we work with all of the shops in our ecosystem to help them sell Drupal 8. Uh, if you go to uh, drupal.org forward slash Drupal hyphen 8.0, because we're nerds, so what would a URL be without a point and a hyphen? Um, we have <laughs> lots of materials about Drupal 8 there, showing what the best features are that are coming out. Uh, and you can get infographics for all kinds of different use cases. We also have landing pages that talk about the various ways that we can use Drupal. We also have a new Try Drupal program that we're launching with uh, currently two, about to be three, soon to be five partners, helping people spin up 30-day free development, uh, three, free 30-day trial Drupal sites so they can evaluate Drupal and decide to become Drupal users themselves. So we help increase Drupal adoption. We also help you build the software. Uh, how many of you guys have started using the comment credit attribution on Drupal.org? Awesome. 
We've had so many people use this. Dries will talk about it. But we're helping you understand how we're building the software together as a community. And we're helping you do that also by uh, giving you better profiles so that when you need help or want to connect with someone in the community who has the skills you need, you can learn more about them. Michael Hess, you look, Mike, you look very handsome here. Yeah, <laughs> nice profile picture. So Drupal powers the best of the web. You power Drupal. Thank you for doing that. And I also want to thank the tremendous ecosystem that's built around Drupal, our partners who help fund the work that we do at the association and within the community. Um, they give us not only money, but they give us amazing time for our entire uh, Drupal year. Um, and specifically here at the conference, the folks who've helped make sure that you could be here and we're going to have a great time. So thank you so much to all our Drupal and DrupalCon sponsors. Yeah. Excellent. OK, also, uh, few housekeeping notes I have to give out. Uh, if you've been here before, you know that it is a tradition to take a group photo immediately following the Dries note. And what you're going to do is stand up, exit the building out that way. You're going to follow Jam. Uh, you may remember him from the Minnie Mouse costume earlier. I understand he's taken it off. That's too bad. Um, but you're going to follow him out, uh, out into the plaza for our group photo immediately following the Dries note. So hustle out, do that. You don't want to miss it. Also, coffee. Apparently, you like it. Um, I want to let you know that there is paid coffee all day in the 300 aisle of the exhibit hall, and there is a free sponsored coffee break at 10.15 this morning. So thanks to Isovera and SiteGround for making that happen. They are sponsoring those coffee breaks today, tomorrow, and Thursday at 10.15. Yes, applause for coffee. <laughs> Wi-Fi. Here is the access. And if you see any Drupal Association staff around today, they also have it printed across their backs. So just be like, hey, nice to meet you. Could you turn around? Um, you'll get the password. Uh, also, if you are in this room right now, one of the things that we do that's amazing about DrupalCon is that we record every session and make it available practically immediately online. It will be much more difficult for us to do that. Uh, we also live stream the keynote, but it'll be much more difficult for us to do that if you are currently sucking the Wi-Fi dead with your MiFi devices. So if you could turn those off, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. OK. And food, uh, lunch options. If you are a vegetarian, you can pick up your food at lunch in the main buffet lines in the exhibit hall. If you are vegan or you have another special meal, you have your own buffet station. And if you just decide you want to be vegan today, don't. Today's not the day to start. Don't eat the vegan's food. Don't make them starve, OK? So if you're not vegan, halal, or have other special food needs, don't go in that line, please. All right, a couple of schedule changes that I think we need to get through. Today from 5 to 6 p.m., room 518, the core conversation is now going to be constructive conflict resolution with Donna Benjamin. I'll see you there. It's on my schedule. And uh, in the Drupal.org track, content strategy for Drupal.org will be at 1 to 2 p.m. today now instead of 2.15 to 3.15. So if you've got your schedules out, jot those notes down. Uh, code of conduct. This is probably my f the reason that I love the Drupal community so much is that we value, uh, we value our commitment to each other. We value inclusivity. We value transparency. We just really respect one another. Um, and our code of conduct is part of that. So let's make sure we live up to it here at the Drupal, uh, DrupalCon Los Angeles. It's up on the website. It's also printed in your program book. And if you do have any issues, we do want you to talk to the community working group. So contact details are there in the code of conduct for that. All right. So also, Drupal Association has a board meeting on Wednesday. Uh, we do always have public board meetings, but they're usually not in person. So this is your chance to see Dries and Angie and all of our other amazing board members in person. It's so exciting. Board meetings, live and in person. Yeah. Approve those minutes. Um, we're going to do that. <laughs> it's a better agenda than that. But we're going to do that uh, on Wednesday at noon. We're going to be in room 410, so come join us. And trivia night. Who loves trivia night? Yeah. 
thank you so much, Palantir.net, for sponsoring this. Uh, the amazing Jeff Eaton is going to be hosting again, so we'll see you at 333, 333 Live. Doors open at 8 on Thursday. Even if you are new to Drupal and know nothing, feel like you can't answer any trivia questions, don't worry. By the time we get started, no one else can remember any answers either. So it's going to be good. Uh, women in Drupal, this meetup, yep. The meetup happens tonight at 6 o'clock at the Engine Co. number 28 on Figaro. So we hope to see you there at this great mixer. And if you haven't gotten your Drupal gear yet, come over to the Drupal store. It's booth 422 in the exhibit hall. Uh, you can get a Drupal t-shirt for your dog, which is obviously what that dog needs. Yeah. Uh, contribution sprints. Who's, who's already sprinted here at DrupalCon? Way to go. We're going to see even more sprinting going on throughout the week. But Friday, of course, is the big all-conference sprint. So even if you've never sprinted before, we strongly encourage you to come out and figure out how to make your contribution to Drupal. Um, we have first-time sprinters workshops available. They're going to get you all set up with the tools you need. We're going to have mentors on hand to help you walk, walk you through it. And then folks that will help you find your very first issue. You're going to write your first patch. Uh, and if you are one lucky person is going to have that very first patch committed live on the spot by our very own Dree. So you want to be part of that, come to the sprints. And with that, I just want to say uh, you, uh, I want to say thank you to a couple of longtime community members that you may remember as Pro People and Blink Reaction. Uh, but today they're here to announce an exciting new joint venture. In the year 2015, two of the largest Drupal companies in the world decided to join forces and create a powerful new brand. <coughs> uh, I'm sorry. <coughs> I think I had a little bit of CQ5 in my throat. As I was saying, at the end of March, Blink Reaction and Pro People decided to join together, creating a brand new agency called FFW. We are a digital agency built on technology, driven by data, and focused on user experience. FFW is 420 people spread across 19 offices and 11 countries. Let's take a tour of our offices. It's important for us to give back to the Drupal community, and we do so all around the world. We have organized and sponsored camps, cons, and training events on four continents. We have two full-time community contributors on staff and hundreds more that are active in the development and maintaining of critical Drupal modules. Drupal is about the people who work to grow it. And the key to continuing our global progress is to support the local communities and individuals that drive the project forward every day. My name is Nancy Stango. And I'm Michael Dreher, and together we're FFW. These past couple of months has been very exciting for us. We've been spending the time getting ready for DrupalCon, but also ready to launch our new joint brand. It sure has been exciting. 
and we'd love to tell you more about it, please stop by our booth, number 300, where you can also get a chance to win a trip to DrupalCon in Barcelona. But before we move on to what you guys are really here for, the keynote, uh, we want to make sure to thank the Drupal Association for giving us the opportunity to show off our new brand. And we want to uh, thank you guys for spending these uh, past five minutes with us. So let's get started. It's with my pleasure to introduce the keynote speaker, the reason why we're all here today, the founder of Drupal and project lead, co-founder and CTO of Acquia, Dries Baitart. Woo! Good morning, everybody. Um, I was actually just like, as I was listening, I was trying to figure out how many of these Drupal cons I've been to, and it, I think it's number 23. And so this is my 23rd keynote, uh, you know, which I think is pretty exciting. Um, so I'll be talking about, um, let's see if this works. Not sure if it works. Okay. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, I'll be giving another state of Drupal, but before I do, I wanted to take a minute and, um, you know, think about Aaron uh, Winborn. Oops. Okay. Aaron Winborn, who unfortunately um, lost his battle with uh, ALS. Uh, for those that don't, you know, know uh, Aaron, um, he was a very well-respected contributor. He was a friend uh, of many of us and really a role model for many of us in the community. Um, and so one of the things that we've decided to do is that the um, community working group created a new program, an award, which we will call the Aaron Winborn Award, which we, every year we will give to somebody in the Drupal community um, that we believe represents our values and um, basically um, you know, is, a, is a great uh, asset to us. And so we'll do that in respect of Aaron. And uh, if you want, you can start nominating people. Um, there's a little bit more information on, on drupal.org, so please check it out. And nominate other people uh, for this award. All right. So today, um, I'll be talking about uh, a number of different things, uh, really. Uh, one of the things that I realized is, as I was traveling around the world, and I was telling some of the stories about the history of Drupal, I kind of noticed that many people didn't know those stories. And so what I want to do today is spend some time retelling some of these stories. Uh, and I think it's important to help us reinforce the culture and, and some of the things that we've gone through to, to help everybody in this room understand where we came from. Uh, in addition to that, I'll also be talking about the future and Drupal 8. I'll give you an update on where we're at, uh, as well as uh, some other things. And so some of you may have heard me talk about some of these things, but um, I'm going to try to add new elements to it and kind of make it interesting for everybody. Um, all right. So I think it was about nine months ago, and I was in Brussels, and I went to this hotel to have a meeting um, you know, with a potential Drupal user. And so it was a little early to this meeting. And so I decided to walk around a little bit in this amazing lobby, actually. And what I saw was quite interesting. On the wall, there was this little photo. Um, and it turns out that many, many years ago, they would organize conferences at this hotel in Brussels. And so they, took, they put up a photo of the people that attended the conference. And so as I was looking at this photograph and at some of the names of the people at this conference, I was actually quite amazed. Um, I was amazed by the fact that all these people kind of lived in the same, you know, little time frame. Like in my mind, I was maybe more spread out. Um, I was also amazed by the fact that they would all come together instead of maybe going off on their own um, or inventing some of these things on their own. Uh, and then if you think about it, these people came together in Brussels. They each invented some really, truly amazing things, things that saved the lives of millions of people, you know, things that evolved into multi-billion dollar businesses. And, you know, they all came together. And so in no means, by no means am I trying to compare ourselves to these people, um, uh, by no means. But as I was looking at this photo, it kind of struck me, like the way we come together and the way we make connections between people has definitely caused some really cool things to happen. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about that 
uh, today. Um, as many of you know, I started the Drupal project in my dorm room uh, in Antwerp in 2000. Um, I wouldn't have been able to do so if it wasn't for the work of some other great people, uh, like the ones that you can see here, that you know, eventually ended up creating a LAMP stack. And so the LAMP stack was born and really allowed me to get started with Drupal. And so my initial plan was to create a quick message board so me and my friends could share messages. But very quickly, this message board evolved into an experimental platform. Like I was interested in the web and I would um, you know, look at emerging trends and I would incor or incorporate these in Drupal. And so within a year, actually, we did three major versions of Drupal. Um, sorry, I'm a little behind. <laughs> we did three major versions of Drupal uh, in one year. Um, and as you can see from the slides, there are some really fundamental things that we added early, early on in the lifetime of Drupal. And some of these things, like blogs, weren't called blogs at the time. We would call them public diaries. And people started to use the internet to share you know, diaries online. And later it became blogging. Or RSS feeds, I was on the mailing list where RSS feeds were invented. And I, you know, I don't take any credit for that, but I was there lurking and it would implement uh, RSS feeds in Drupal. Um, and so um, one of the things that I started to do is I really wanted to have people use Drupal. And so I would effectively reach out to people. And before I started with Drupal, uh, I was into the Linux kernel. Uh, I contributed, contributed a little bit to the Linux kernel. And so I would follow a website which was called uh, Kernel Trap. And uh, Kernel Trap was managed by you know, Jeremy Andrews. Um, at the time, Linux and the Linux kernel was a very hot topic, and everybody wanted to read about it. And so what Jeremy would do is he would basically, you know, listen in on the kernel mailing list, and he would take interesting conversation and would blog about it. And so Slashdot, I don't know how many people know Slashdot. Do you know Slashdot? All right, a lot of people do. Um, but, you know, back in the day, there was something called the Slashdot effect. And so this was in a time where you know, dealing with unexpected traffic spikes or hosting, it wasn't what it is today. And so every time somebody got on Slashdot, you know, the site would typically go down. And so they called this the Slashdot effect. Um, or if your site didn't go down, people usually ended up with a hosting bill of thousands of dollars. Um, so this big thing at the time. And so every time Jeremy got on Slashdot, his site went down. And so he was using something called PHP Nuke or PHP uh, post nuke, I believe. And so I emailed uh, Jeremy and I said, um, you know, you should really convert your website to Drupal. Um, and here's a screenshot of that email. <laughs> Actually, this is the original email. And I used Pine <laughs> back in the day, for those that remember Pine. <laughs> and uh, I basically said, if you convert your website to Drupal, it will never crash again. <laughs> And, and to close the deal, I offered, you can see it here, I offered to give him access, admin access to my own website, uh, you know, which was based on Drupal. And so I offered that up to him and I did. And this is, this is what it looked like at the time. And so this was Drupal around 2002, I think. Um, of course, that sealed the deal. <laughs> It was very pretty. For those that were around, you may remember, like, all these admin links, what we did is we sorted the admin links by module name. Um, and so things like information architecture, usability, was, it was basically non-existing. And so, you know, Jeremy did convert his website to Drupal. And of course, the first time he ends up on uh, Slashdot, the site crashed. <laughs> <laughs> and so we were like, err, err. Um, but we, we used it as a learning point and we made some changes to Drupal. Um, I remember I improved the caching of Drupal and Jeremy um, took the lead in creating a module called the throttle module. And the throttle module was cool because what it would do is it would look for spikes in traffic and then automatically disable features based on the load. And so for example, if the load reached level five, we would say, let's disable the forum module block. When the, when the load would reach level 
six, we would disable commenting altogether. <laughs> and so you can configure all of these things. And so, you know, next time you got on Slashdot, it worked. And so, you know, everybody was very happy. And so a lot of that work basically translated in, uh, you know, early 2002, which became Drupal 4.0. And so we added the node system, by the way, in 2002. We added a caching layer, and then we added the throttle module. And then also, we started getting all of these patches to make Drupal faster, including a new taxonomy module that was more scalable. Turns out later that a lot of these patches came from you know, somebody that was running an adult entertainment website. And so he had a need to take Drupal to uh, sort of the next level um, <laughs> in terms of scaling. And so you know, Drupal 4 is a lot about scalability and making it work better. All right, and so, all right. And so, that's pretty cool because what happened next is that Jeremy was really hooked on Drupal and ended up starting a company called Tag One, which ended up employing a lot of our key contributors that ended up you know, doing a lot of great things for Drupal. He also started Drupal Watchdog and all of these things. So this little email that I sent, and you know, basically stretching the truth maybe a little bit, <laughs> um, has actually been a good thing because Jeremy joined our community and has given back a you know, hundred times more. Um, and a few years ago, actually, Jeremy emailed me back that email. That, that's why I still have it. <laughs> um, and he said, this email changed my life, which, is, uh, which was kind of nice of him to do. And so there's two quick lessons. Um, the first lesson you may not like, because um, sometimes I give presentations at uh, other conferences about startups and how to grow things, whether it's a company or an open source project. And one of the things that's key is that you have to sell. And when I say sell, I mean that in the broad sense. Like you have to evangelize your vision. Even if you're working on a patch, you need to sell your vision for that, for that patch. If you're working on an initiative, you have to sell your vision for that initiative. Or even for those of us that run companies, if you're recruiting, you know, getting people to join your company it's a, is a form of selling as well. And then once they join your company, you then need to sell them on you know, where you want to go with your company. So um, you know, when I do these presentations from time to time, and in, I'm in a room full of engineers, you know, not unlike this, and I tell them, the one thing you have to learn is to sell. Usually, like, the room gets a little quiet. Um, but I do believe it's true. And I also do believe it's not like pure selling. It's like selling as a, you know, in the broad sense, so to speak. And then so once you sold somebody, the key is to make them successful. Like, it's actually very simple. Growing your community is bringing people on board and then making them successful. And if you do so, amazing things will happen. And Jeremy, I think, is a great example. And I can at least name 12 other examples of people that join our community and you know, ended up doing amazing things. All right, so these are my first two lessons for you. So by 2000, we had Drupal 4 and we had all of these features. And in many ways, we were ahead of the curve. Like this was before you know, Web 2.0. I think it only came in 2005, three years later. And so we had a lot of these building blocks at the time to build dynamic websites and to build interactive websites, which would later become Web 2.0. And so the fact that we had these features you know, caused something really cool to happen. Um, so basically in 2004, Howard Dean, who was a presidential candidate here in the United States, um, decided to do something very innovative. And he was the first presidential candidate to use or leverage the internet to campaign. And he would raise millions of dollars. And he did that with something called Dean Space. And Dean Space effectively was a Drupal distribution. Right? And so while he was the underdog, and he obviously didn't win the elections, he actually got very far to the point that people said, wow, this is game changing. This is game changing to the point that by the next presidential elections, every presidential candidate will use the internet uh, to do this. And so Dean Space was actually a very big 
turning point for us, and we got mentions in all sorts of media like Time and the Wall Street Journal and all these kinds of things. Also, a lot of great people joined the Drupal project through Dean Space, and you can see some of the names here. Um, Andy Rappaport actually ended up on the board of the Huffington Post. There's David Strauss and Zach Rosen. Kieran, who was an amazing connector still today, and sort of you know, brought a lot of these people together. And so even though Dean Space or Howard Dean didn't win, it was a great win for Drupal. Like these people joined and uh, some great things happened. All right, so then Andy Rappaport, who is also an investor, he said, you know what, I like this idea. You know, I think we need to invest in this Dean Space idea. And he decided to start a company or fund the team behind Dean Space or a part of that team to create a company called Civic Space. And the idea behind Civic Space was to take the Dean, you know, Dean Space platform, if you will, and get it ready for the next presidential elections. Problem, though, was the next presidential elections wasn't for another four years. <laughs> And so they could build all of this technology, but they couldn't test it. And so they built this company. Um, some other great people joined, actually. Uh, Chris Messina uh, was very active in Drupal. Uh, he ended up being instrumental in OpenID and OAuth, and also ended up inventing the hashtag. <laughs> um, he joined uh, the Drupal community. And basically what they said is, you know what? Because there is no presidential election, we're going to campaign for something else. And so they said, um, and at the time, Mozilla, which we all know, uh, basically had created Firefox. And they said, we're going to campaign for Firefox. And they built this website called Spread Firefox. Um, and they got some other people on board. Uh, and they started to use Drupal and make Drupal better to promote Firefox. And so they did all sorts of cool things. Um, like one of the things that I, that I remember is, at some point they said, we're gonna raise $50,000, and we're gonna use that money to buy a two-page ad in the New York Times to kind of make fun at the time of um, you know, Microsoft Internet Explorer, to tell the world there is a great alternative. And so they did, they raised $50,000, and they ended up you know, promoting Firefox in the New York Times, as well as in many other um, locations. And so in many ways, Drupal helped, you know, spread Firefox and Firefox become a thing. Like we were instrumental in getting them uh, adoption. All right. And so, you know, here we are. Dean Space had just used Drupal. Spread Firefox was a great success. And it really kind of helped us grow as a community, gave us credibility. Um, and then, just like in that photo that I showed you, a lot of these early adopters, they went on to do many great things. Uh, it's kind of amazing, actually. Uh, one of them um, ended up starting a company, Blue State Digital, and when President Obama decided to run, they said, I want to work with that agency because they were involved with Dean Space. And so Blue State Digital um, helped President Obama um, you know, win the election from a, you know, digital point of view. And so all of these people were involved with Drupal, uh, which is kind of um, amazing. And to me, that is lesson number three. It's all about the people. Like, attract great people, and amazing things will happen. All right. Lesson four um, is to go back to what I showed you earlier. It's like, you know, you want to recognize trends early, and you want, you know, how do you attract these great people? Well, it's to have a great platform, you know, with things that people really love. And so I think there's also a very important lesson there. Uh, recognize trends early and embrace them. And so by this time in the history of Drupal, we really felt like we were onto something. Like, it was kind of hard to believe um, that all of these things had happened and that we got some press. And so we decided to organize the very first DrupalCon. We organized it in Antwerp, where I was living at the time, and we had 27 people in attendance. And I remember I couldn't believe that 27 people wanted to travel to Antwerp to talk about Drupal for three days. 
I thought it was like unheard of. I thought it was crazy. <laughs> Um, because for the most part, I would work on it, you know, from home, and I wouldn't really talk to my friends about it, or like it was kind of like what I did. Um, and so we organized the very first DrupalCon in Antwerp, and these people all traveled to Antwerp uh, to talk about Drupal. At the time, by the way, we had the Node system. Um, I think it was Bert Kessels. He had created FlexiNode, which was kind of like CCK. Uh, before CCK, and at DrupalCon Antwerp, we spent at least a day of the three days sort of architecting CCK. And so now CCK is the entity API and all of these things. So if you think about it, it took 10 years <laughs> for us to go from, you know, Flexi you know, to CCK to the entity API that we know today. Um, kind of interesting. All right, and so as we grew and as, you know, more people joined the project, um, something else happened. Around 2005, um, there was a big server meltdown. And, I, and I've told this, this story before as well, but at the time I was running Drupal.org on a shared hosting account. So one of the Drupal people, Kerten Manus, he had like a little server somewhere which, on which he hosted client projects, and he said, yeah, sure, you can have a shell account, and you can run the Drupal.org website from my shell account. And so by 2005, we had so many people coming to the Drupal.org website, to D2O, that basically the server crashed. And like I shifted a lot of my focus, and, and Kerten did the same, from actually working on Drupal to you know, tuning the machine. Um, but as I said, at some point, it just it crashed. So the only thing that I could think of is to replace all of the pages on D2O on with like a white page, and there was a donate button, uh, a PayPal donate, donate button. And we had a little bit of text, like please donate some money so we can buy a bigger server. Because I was a student, I didn't have any money, and we did some quick back of the envelope calculations, and we said if we have $3,000, we can buy this huge server. Like we wouldn't have to buy a server for like five years. <laughs> and, and so we replaced every single page on the Edo with a blank page, a donate button, and something amazing happened. Like within 24 hours, uh, people had contributed $10,000. And so I never had $10,000 in my life. And so completely freaked out. Um, I remember changing my PayPal password to be like this long. <laughs> um, PayPal immediately blocked my account <laughs> because for the five, the, you know, the first five years of Drupal, I got like $50 over, you know, over five years. So, and all of a sudden, we get like $10,000 in, in two days. And so we had to deal with unblocking that. Um, and then something else happened. Tim Bray, who was a CTO at Sun Microsystem uh, Systems, but also co-invented XML, by the way. He emailed and said, you know what? I've been tracking Drupal. It's kind of cool. We use it within Sun. I just shipped you a $7,000 Sun machine. And I was like, wow, <laughs> here we are, $10,000. And basically the next day, a $7,000 Sun server arrived on the curb. Um, and so we, you know, we ended up using this machine and it, you know, we called it Sun Price because it was a surprise from Sun. Uh, it may still be in use, I don't know. <laughs> no longer in use. <laughs> <God>. <laughs> Um, and then something else happened. The OSL, the open source labs in, in Portland, they said, you know what, we can host a server for you. Like, we'll give you bandwidth, electricity, and oh, by the way, we have some students. They can help run it for you. Just ship us a server. I'm like, wow. Within two days, all of these things came together. And so we shipped the Sun Machine to Portland, and we ended up buying, I think, three more servers with the $10,000 because we felt like and it raised the money for servers, so we should use it for servers. And so all of a sudden, we went from a little shared hosting account to this, like, what looked like, you know, capacity for the next, you know, 20 years. Um, but um, in many ways, this was like an amazing, you know, point in the history of Drupal, because for the first time, you could see sort of the magic of the Drupal community like how people would come together um, you know, and chip in and really sort of uh, do something great here. And so 
what we did is we made this Drupal poster inspired by the Spread Firefox New York Times app, which basically would list all of the names of the people that chipped in money. And we would take it around the world to our events and put it up as a thank you. Um, and so it was really nice. And so I think the lesson there is, uh, you know, it's all about the community. If you want to go far, you want to go together. All right, later in 2005, we all got together at OS CMS. And so this was kind of like a DrupalCon, really, but we decided to invite other projects. And it was like 90% Drupal people and 10% other people. <laughs> but we tried to embrace them and welcome them by changing the name of our conference uh, for one time. And so Boris Mann and Kieran and myself, we sat down on this couch in Portland and we said, we need to start the Drupal Association. We need to start the Drupal Association because I just accepted $10,000 in my personal checking account. <laughs> and technically, I have to pay income tax on that. <laughs> That's not cool. I, I, you know, still to date, I think I owe the, the tax authorities <laughs> income tax on that $10,000. But we said, really, we need to organize ourselves a little bit better, start an association, so at least we have a checking account. So we can you know, take in money and use it to help grow Drupal. And also, because we didn't have any money, and so this was at the uh, OSCOM O'Reilly uh, conference. O'Reilly was nice enough to give us a little booth area without having to pay. And they gave us literally like the booth area all the way in the corner, <laughs> the furthest away from the entrance. And we didn't have any money, so we couldn't afford to buy a table. Like you had to buy these, uh, you, can boot, you could buy a table, you could buy carpet. And so we had none of this. Um, but what's really cool is all the other booths that had re really nice tables and you know, whatever, all these things, they had no people there. But we had so many people in our booth and people would sit on the floors and hack and coat and you can see some of it uh, in the photo um, that it really felt like, all right, this is, this is kind of the beginning, if you will, of something great. And so what happened next, really, the next few years, I mean, there's a lot of stories there as well, but. Uh, I would describe it as the era of lots of people joining, you know, companies being started, the commercial ecosystem around Drupal was created. Um, and so, you know, DrupalCon kept on growing and growing. Uh, lots of great things. More and more bigger users came along. Um, so a lot of sort of expansion. But at some point, um, I think it was around DrupalCon Paris, um, we started, because we had grown so much, um, like we started like, what are we? <laughs> we started having sort of existential questions. And like, are we a product? Are we a framework? Um, and we were kind of confused about that. And I think that's when we started talking about things like small core. And uh, what's nice about the Eiffel Tower, by the way, that it's both a product and a framework. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we get it. <laughs> um, and so we started talking about this. And the way that happened, in, in my opinion, from where I was sitting, is when I started Drupal, it was really for me, by me. Like, I was building it for myself. But nobody else was using it. Nobody else was contributing to it. And then I made it open source. And really what happened is it was now by developers for developers like other people that wanted to use Drupal as their experimental platform. And all of a sudden, by this time, there was this idea of there's users of Drupal too, like non-technical users. And so um, they came in, they started you know, asking for things, and a lot of us wanted to cater to them. And so there was a lot of tension, I would say, around do we just care about ourselves as developers, or do we also want to care more about um, you know, end users? And so one of the things that came out of that, I think, is we decided to focus on providing better usability. And we made actually some very bold moves, which created all sorts of shockwaves uh, in the community. We, you know, Acquia was founded, and we said, we're going to hire Mark Bolton. And we're going to hire him to redesign the uh, Drupal 7 admin UI. And so he did. Like, he looked at our information architecture. He created the 7 theme. Uh, you know, all sorts of things came out of that. We also started doing usability testing in Minnesota where we would observe people using Drupal. And it was shocking. It was shocking to see 
how hard it was to use Drupal. Um, we also ended up doing things like Spark. And so in many ways, these things weren't natural for us to embrace and to start doing, but we, you know, we decided to do them anyway. And I think it helped. Like, I think we have a long way to go, but I do believe that we've got much better at talking to end users and embracing end users. And I think as we grow, we'll see more and more needs to you know, cater to them. Um, all right, so, and I think, it took us a little while, at least for me, maybe. Um, but we started to get this idea, like, you know, Drupal is both a framework and it's an application. It's a framework, it's for developers, by developers, but if you have a great framework, people can build great applications on top of that. And what happens is there is like this flywheel, almost. Um, as the framework gets better, the applications can become better. And as the applications get better, they start to be more demanding of the framework, and so it's like this vicious circle almost that makes it better and better and better. Um, anyway, so we did a lot of work around UX, and it was a difficult time in, in many ways from a, from a community point of view. At the same time, we also decided, for the reasons that I just explained, that we needed to be a better framework too. It wasn't one or the other. And so, you know, a lot of this is reflected in, in Drupal 8, but we ended up spending a lot of time making Drupal a better framework. Um, and you know, things like Symfony and embracing object-oriented programming, um, the Entity API and the Fields API and plugins and CMI. I mean, there's a long list of things that we did to make Drupal a better framework. And so we really chose to be both. And I, I still today believe that is the right thing to do. I think um, the fact that we can do both makes us both a great framework and a great product. And it's really, about, the combined thing is called a platform. And I think it's really what's unique about Drupal that we're probably the only, you know, maybe not the only, but one of very few real platforms out there. And so the lesson though here is that sometimes we don't always agree on things and it takes us a while to discuss, but discussion is a good thing, it's not a bad thing. We don't always have to agree, we just have to work through these disagreements. All right, because we started um, you know, making these frameworks better and products better, um, you know, Drupal became bigger and bigger and bigger in a way. And so uh, the last few years, there's been a lot of talk about how do we sustain Drupal if it becomes so bigger, like uh, too complex maybe for volunteers to dive in and take on big projects or a lot of burden on relatively few people and they risk burning out, or how do we keep innovating fast? So there's all of these questions because we grew in size um, over the years. And so I spoke a, a lot about this actually in Amsterdam, at DrupalCon Amsterdam, and prior to that keynote, I spent a lot of time reading about um, you know, academic research and books about these kinds of problems because we're not the only one that we're not the only organization that has this problem. Like every public good actually has this problem. And so one of the books I read is The Logic of Collective Action. And I encourage you, encourage you to read it as well. Uh, but basically what this book says, it's based on research, is as you grow as an organization, as a public good, you know, and as an open source community, the cost of contributing increases. I think we can all relate to that. If the code base gets more complex, it's harder and harder to you know, get in and make changes or to do you know, really fundamental work. But also, the second thing is, as you grow, the benefits of contributing decrease. Because think about it, like in the early days of Drupal, I could put every contributor on a slide and you could clearly see, here's the, you know, five contributors to Drupal. Today, it's actually hard to put them in a tag cloud, let alone in a slide with images and all of these things. And so the individual reward from contributing in the eyes of many people, maybe not everyone, decreases. So you have these two trends which actually make it more and more difficult to, to contribute. And so, you know, there's a lot of material around this, but there's basically this notion of 
you know, freeloaders, people that use the software without giving back to the software. And that's not necessarily a bad term. It has a negative connotation, but it's perfectly fine for people to just use the software. We need those people, actually. But then on the other hand, there is what they call caretakers. These are the people that help us maintain and build the software. And so basically, if you put this theory in practice, what you have is something like this. When the project is small and everything is by developers for developers, you have a very healthy ratio probably between free loaders and caretakers. But as you grow, that ratio starts to change. You have relatively few caretakers compared to the number of um, you know, users. But really what you want is probably something um, that has a bit of a healthier ratio, maybe something like this. Right? This is also commonly referred to as a tragedy of the commons. And so this is the stuff that I talked about uh, in my keynote. And uh, I encourage you to go watch that keynote <laughs> if you want to know more about the details. Um, sorry. All right, and so we decided, leaving Amsterdam to, you know, to start experimenting more and more with these things. And so I wanted to give you a qu quick update. So one thing you can do with the scale is reducing costs, right? It's a scale, so if you reduce the cost, um, you lower the barriers to contribution. And in fact, we've kind of done a lot of things here, I think. Um, like, for example, the fact that we embraced Symfony. It's a way of outsourcing a lot of the code, if you will. And so that reduces the cost of the code base. We also uh, empowered the Drupal Association to do more of the maintenance of Drupal.org. Right? And so it used to be that the core developers, very few people may know this, but it used to be the case that the core developers also maintain Drupal.org. Um, and that's also an artifact, I guess, of, you know, when I was starting with Drupal, I would basically develop life on, on Drupal.org. <laughs> um, and so obviously that had to change. Um, but, you know, things like better governance, you know, work on the test bots, all of these things help to reduce the cost. And we should also keep doing more and more of these things. We should all be thinking, like, how can we reduce the cost of contributing to Drupal? Because at the same time, we're also increasing the cost. I mean, let's be honest, like, Drupal 8 is maybe a little bit more complex too, right? And so it's, it's a balancing act there as well. All right. The other thing I talked about is this idea of selective benefits. And this is the academic terms. You can go read about it. But the way they solve this problem with other public goods is they give the people that contribute, that help maintain the public good, whether it's Drupal or if it's a park or you know, anything, they give them you know, benefits. And so that increases the uh, benefits. And so out of that idea, we launched, I think I started talking about this over a year ago, but this idea of organizational commit credits. You know, and you can see it here, it's a little animated GIF, so it loops around. Um, but that's actually deployed since Amsterdam, and so as you contribute to Drupal, um, in, on Drupal.org, you can now attribute your contribution. Maybe not every contribution today, but you know, we may expand this, but you can uh, attribute your contribution to the organization that's paying you to do this work, and even the customer that's paying your organization to do so. What's nice about that is that we can start to see how our community actually works. Like, you know, we can see how much is volunteer driven, how much is driven by the commercial ecosystem, but we can also reward the organizations that let their developers contribute, right? And so we don't have that data on, on the website yet, but and we ran some quick numbers, and you can see that there's actually, this is just the top 10, but there's actually a good list of companies that allow their employees to contribute um, to Drupal. And this is not just for Drupal core, this is also for contribute modules. Um, and so the way we could use this information, and this is, these are the things that we're gonna work on next, is the way we can use that information um, is by providing some benefits to these organizations. And so here's an example of, uh, you know, Cap Gemini. Um, so we have organizational profiles on Ditado, and we could do these little badges or some statistics. And the organizations that I talk to, they're very excited about this, because for them, what they want is 
They want to be able to attract great developers. And so the fact that that organization is contributing to Drupal um, is something that a lot of us like. We want to go work for companies that give back, right? But also, they like to use it when they need to convince customers. Like, you know, we know Drupal because we contribute to Drupal, right? So these are mock-ups. It may not look exactly like this, um, but that's the kind of thinking. And it doesn't have to be limited to profile pages. We can, you know, trickle these things in across the website. For example, um, job boards. Like, you know, if you're looking for jobs, you know, companies that allow their employees to contribute, you know, we can highlight them in the job boards and makes it easier for you know, individuals to find great companies to work. So the idea is that that hopefully will allow organizations to justify contributing, uh, letting their employees contribute to Drupal. All right. So the other thing that we decided to try is fundraising. And Holly talked a little bit about this already, but we said we're going to raise some money from everybody in the community to try and accelerate the release of Drupal 8, right? Um, and so we set a goal of we want to raise $250,000, and we would use that money to fund sprints where core contributors, core developers get together and they work on release blocking issues. In addition to organizing sprints, we also decided to pay um, you know, developers for fixing release blocking bugs. So you know, fixing this bug, we're going to give you $1,000 or you know, whatever to help fix that. And so we, we raised a good amount of money. Um, you know, again, a lot of that money comes from either users of Drupal or you know, the Drupal shops. And I'm, Proud to announce that Time Inc. Had just, has just committed to donate another $25,000 to Drupal Accelerate. So, <laughs> very generous. And so the slider will move up a little bit. <laughs> um, all right. So, these are some of the things we're experimenting with. Um, it's not too late to contribute to Drupal 8 Accelerate. We're still raising money. Um, all right, and so the history of Drupal, um, you know, obviously it's been years in the working. It's been 15 years almost of you know working on Drupal, and so a lot of people that I talk to they don't realize this that it's been 15 years, or like the example of FlexiNode becoming CCK, becoming the NTT API. I mean, these things don't evolve super fast, so to speak. Um, but um, definitely the history of Drupal has been one of you know, overcoming a lot of milestones, whether it's you know, fixing the performance issues you know, for Jeremy on Kernel Trap, or whether it's having to start the Drupal Association so we can actually take in money to buy hardware <laughs> or organize conferences, or whether it's working through things like small core or you know, how do we get more end users engaged and designers into the project to how do we sustain the development of core you know, over the next five to 10 years, if not longer. And so the history of Drupal is this chain, if you will, of different you know, milestones. And I'm sure there will be many more milestones ahead of us. And this is not a bad thing, right? Like I think, Overcoming these milestones is actually what makes us strong. It's a fact that we didn't have $3,000 to buy a new server. The fact that we had to come together as a community and chip in money is really what created you know, camaraderie, what created the sense of community. And so learning to overcome these obstacles is actually what, is, what makes us better. So you know, it's, not a, it's not a bad thing. All right. If you look at all these lessons, and there's many more, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot of important stories, and I forgot a lot of other key people in the history of Drupal. Um, but if you apply these lessons when you look forward, I, I mean, I think we need to continue to, to do the same things. We need to recognize the next trends early. We need to implement those, we, because we want to attract more amazing people to our project that can go on and do great things with Drupal. We need to stick together as a community 
Like, we need to build this together. We shouldn't be afraid to have disagreements and to have discussions, um, because overcoming these disagreements is, is a key part of what makes us successful. Um, and we shouldn't be afraid to evangelize or sell our vision or the things that we, we want to achieve. Um, and we should definitely stay committed to making our users successful, just like we made Jeremy successful. And so if you do all of these things, and we have done a lot of these things, and, and I feel we've made a real difference. And this is, when I wake up in the morning, this is what I'm proud about, the fact that we've made a difference. Uh, we've made a difference to the lives of, you know, individuals. Like, you know, I mentioned that Jeremy emailed me. Like, this, this one email that I sent, you know, maybe a couple emails, um, you know, he said it changed my life. And I'm sure it changed the lives of many people in this room. So not only did we directly change the life of individuals, I think we're also making a difference uh, in the world indirectly by enabling a lot of great organizations to do great things. You know, like hundreds of thousands of nonprofits using Drupal. They use Drupal to better fulfill their mission, to raise money for their cause, to activate their members. And so if we can make Drupal a little bit better, you know, we basically enable them to be more efficient at changing the world, right? We're enablers, indirect enablers too. Obviously government-related things like the ones I talked about, but even commercial organizations like Tesla now, Tesla Motors runs on Drupal, um, and they're doing some great, cool things for the world, too. Electric cars are not a bad thing. You know, batteries are not a bad thing. And so Tesla is somewhere in the room here as well. Uh, definitely encourage you to talk to them. To the stuff we've done for we the people. Like, we took a basic fundamental right of every American citizen to petition their government. Something... I, didn't, I don't even know how people used to do these things, like probably writing a letter or on the corner streets, and we moved that online, and so now everybody can petition the government, right? These are all things, small little bits that help make things better. And so that got me thinking, like, what can we do? You know, if that's what kind of fires me up. What can we do to make an even bigger difference? And so what if I gave you $1,000? What would you use $1,000 for to make an even bigger difference, right? Something to think about. Um, and so I started thinking about that. I didn't know what I want to do with my $1,000, but I do have an idea of how we can <laughs> make a bigger difference. And so a lot of things right now are a little bit broken or could be improved upon. And I think one example is education. I mean, there's nothing wrong with education as it is today, but it's an example of where the web and digital is kind of transforming things uh, for better. So if you think about education, the way it works today, it's like usually it's in a classroom style environment. You have to go there physically. Then there's a teacher that tells you uh, all sorts of things. You know, first of all, if you want to have the best teachers, you need to have a lot of money, right? If you want to be, if you want to, study computer science and you want to go to MIT, I mean, it's kind of expensive. Secondly, because often these teachers are in front of like hundreds or dozens of students at the same time, they can actually control which students are falling behind. They don't necessarily know which are the weaker students and which students may need extra attention or extra lessons or exercises. And so I think there's a huge opportunity for the web and Drupal to change that? What if we could um, provide the best teacher to everybody in the world, right? And I think that's where the web is really disrupting education. Like, you know, Tim Berners-Lee, if you want to learn about the web, could teach, you know, kids everywhere in the world, thanks to some of the technology that's coming along. And some of these technologies are also smart. Like, I don't know if you have used Duolingo, you know, to learn languages. But what they'll do is, like, if you're behind on a certain aspect of the language, say Spanish, it will automatically start giving you more, you know, exercises on the areas that you're weak at. And so some of these things, I feel like, have the opportunity to benefit billions of people. I really do believe it. Um, some quick other examples, like disaster relief, and we actually have some examples of this, but... Um, 
You know, if things go bad in the world, like, you know, getting the right information to the right people very fast, um, you know, I think is key, right? What, what should you do if this happens? Uh, and so I really believe, like, information can actually help uh, save lives. Um, doesn't have to be for the greater good or that kind of stuff. Even in business, I think there's a lot of great examples. Travel, for example. Right now, if you open a travel website, say you flew from A to B, you arrived in B, you open the website, it will ask you to book another flight. But really, what you probably want is if you lost your luggage, you want the website or the app to say, hey, you, your luggage is lost. Here's what you should do next. Or if you lost your connecting flight, it should be smart enough to say, do you want to book this new flight? Or if you lost your connecting flight and there is no more flights, it should say, there is no more flights? I can book you a room in this hotel. Right? It, like, there's so many things that we can do to build better experiences for, you know, for people, to make their lives a little bit better. Um, and so, I think the opportunity that we have here is pretty much limitless. Um, and so I think all of these examples, and I can give you many more ex examples, but I think what it all, all comes down to is providing the right information to the right person at the right time. And I really believe that that would make the world a better place, so to speak. And so the question is, you know, how would you do these things and that kind of stuff. And so, I've written about this you know, recently, which is this idea of the big reverse of the web. And I think if we want to see that vision, the right information at the right time to the right user, in the right format even, become a reality, we need to make some very big changes to the web. And specifically, I believe that we have to transform from what I call the pool-based web to a push-based web. Today, too often, you have to go to somewhere to find the information, multiple websites to, to get the information you want. Or if an emergency happens, you have to go and find out what you should do. Like, it's very pull-based. The opportunity is to become push-based, where information, where content starts to find you. Right? I think, I think this will be a very big transformation that will happen in the next 10 years. Sorry, I'm ahead of my slides. <laughs> Content will find you. And in fact, it's already happening. And very few people realize this, but if you think about some of the big industries or the big platforms out there um, in media, typically people consume media by going to multiple websites, go to the New York Times, go to the, another website and read the things you like. But then Flipboard came along. How many of you use Flipboard? Many people, quite a few people. So Flipboard is interesting because you tell it what you're interested in, you know, cars, for example, and it will look across hundreds of thousands of websites and find you all the car-related articles that may be of interest, and it will push it to you. And it's very disruptive. It's a very successful uh, company. Um, and it doesn't mean, like, there's no room for serendipity. I mean, there's a lot of content that it pushes to you, and you can explore within that stream uh, of content. It's happening for products as well, not just for news. Think about Pinterest, where you like things or you organize things in boards, and automatically Pinterest will start to push you other things you might be interested in. Um, and in fact, my favorite example is staying in touch with your friends and family. Like the way that used to work and still does today is you would call your mom or your dad and say, hey, how are things going? And call your friends. And very pull based. Like you have to, like, you know, um, reach out to them. And really, Facebook changed that. Like, you can, using Facebook, you can stay in touch with many more friends and family, um, and that information is pushed, pushed to you. You know, same thing is happening with media, um, where you used to dial in into different radio stations, things like Spotify and Pandora, are really examples of going from pull to push. Uh, so I think it's a very powerful trend. Um, that I think we'll see more and more of. But all of these things have in common is that they establish one-on-one -on -one relationships. I think this is actually a very big deal. Like they know the user, they know the visitor, they know their interests. They're very content rich too. They actually often use more content, um, you know, because a lot of these examples I gave are actually aggregators, but they don't have to be. 
They're also contextual, meaning they know your interests and they work on different channels. And so let's go back to the example of um, you know, um, ed education, right? And so how can we provide the best teacher to these kids? Um, well, you know, first of all, um, you know, we need to know a few things about these users, like where do they live, you know, what do they like, what are their interests, and you know, maybe we know that they're interested in building websites, and so how can we basically provide them the best possible training? How can we get MIT teachers to, uh, you know, on their machines, or whatever the best teacher is, and how can we make it so that they can continuously learn, and if they get behind, they get extra lessons, uh, all of these things, right? So how do we do that? And so this is a little bit more technical, but still very high level. <laughs> um, but here's what I think you need. First of all, you need this idea of users, right? And you want to enrich these users with metadata. Maybe it's location, maybe it's their interest, you know, whatever it is. You want to enrich more richer user profiles. And I think Drupal 8 is actually in a great spot to do so. Like, you know, users are entity, they're, you know, fieldable. They can be extended in many ways. Um, so I think we're in a great position there. At the same time, you need lots of content. Like if you're trying to match lessons with students, you need all these lessons. And so being able to create great content is very important. And in fact, if you play this out in your head, um, we may actually need much more content than we have today because the opportunity here is that we could tailor some of these lessons very much more closely to the audience. For example, if we know the, the students are young, you know, we can kind of send a variant of those lessons, or if we know it's maybe to um, you know, young boys or young girls, we can even tweak the lessons based on these kinds of things. There's a lot of ways why we could actually leverage more content to provide better lessons. Um, and so this idea of being able to create more content and then also attach metadata to it so we can you know, categorize the content for uh, adults, for young people, whatever it is. And so it turns out Drupal 8 is really good at this too. Like a lot of the work we've done around the Entity API and the taxonomy system improvements, the fact that uh, content is more structured and more semantic and the fact that we can translate content more easily I think are all key things in Drupal 8 that will help us do that as well. And then the trick is how do we match the right content to the right user, right? And I think there's this magic function, if you will, which is get the best next experience, right? I think this is kind of the holy grail um, of what I think most websites will start to figure out how do we implement get best next experience. If you're a student looking for the next lesson, you know, whatever is the next lesson based on how you did in the previous lessons, based on your interest, for example, these kids uh, in Africa, maybe it's you know, rain season or something, like can we find lessons that will leverage the context of these students to provide a great learning experience? Or you know, get best next experience in the travel example could be um, if the luggage is lost, do this. If, you know, missed connecting flights, do this. And so this is the closest I've come to coding <laughs> in a few uh, months. Uh, but you can, you know, probably imagine <laughs> some pseudo code in your head of how we could implement some of these things. All right, so you have these enriched user profiles and you have this enriched content and you know, this magical function, get best next experience, is what, you know, will bring these things together. I think often you can implement these things in Drupal, but I think also very often you wanna make, you know, calls to third-party services. For example, I could imagine in the example of education that you wanna do a call to a uh, scoring service. Maybe there's another system that scores students, but you wanna get their score to help with the matchmaking. Um, I think that's a kind of an intuitive example. Um, and once you find the right content, I think you have to output it in, a, you know, in the right format. So it's great that Drupal supports 
uh, structure content and then send it to the right endpoint. In the case of a smartphone with native apps or uh, like an Apple Watch, I think you want to use things like JSON and RESTful web services. Like, how many people realize that the Apple Watch doesn't have a browser? Uh, most people don't. But the Apple Watch doesn't have, a, doesn't have a browser. It's something to think about and how that changes things, if, if these things will actually take off. Uh, obviously, we will also output these things to, to actual browsers. And so we've made a lot of great improvements in Drupal 8 around you know, layouts and you know, templating with Twig and responsive design and HTML5 and all of these things. So Drupal also, for that, will do a great job. Um, and then this, like, imagine in a world where most websites implement this function, get best next experience, no two experiences might actually be the same. Like my Facebook page looks very different than your Facebook page and looks very different than your Facebook page. And actually no two, no two pages Facebook generates are identical. So imagine in extremis where Drupal now has to serve pages where no two pages are identical. That makes it a lot harder to cache, right? It's a world that is 100% dynamic. I'm not saying that's what it will be like, but it could be like that for some cases. And so there's a lot of work that we've done around you know, performance and scalability, where you know, we can use more precise caching, more precise caching validation. We can offload some of the work to the client or to different um, you know, layers in the stack, to the edge maybe. We're also working towards, um, and this is not in core, uh, this idea of the Facebook uh, big pipe, which basically flips the entire Drupal rendering pipeline kind of upside down, um, but will allow us to hopefully build these kinds of experiences, experiences and to scale them effectively. Again, something that we aspire to do, uh, not yet in core. And so all these things considered, I do really believe that Drupal 8 will be a game changer. We've worked on this for four years with hundreds of new features. I think a lot of the new features are at the right time, at the right place, and hopefully in a way that you know, the Dean Space people were attracted to Drupal because it had all of these great features at the right time. Hopefully, people will start doing the same thing with Drupal 8 and will be inspired by some of the possibilities that Drupal 8 will enable. Of course, the big question is when can we use it? <laughs> um, the answer is that it's actually already in use today. Um, not everybody may, might realize this, but there's you know, several hundreds of websites that are in production you know, built on Drupal 8. It's not something we recommend, but if you know what you're doing, you can start using Drupal 8 today. Um, the upgrade pad isn't fully supported. We're trying to support it through projects like Head to Head Upgrade. I encourage you to check that out. Um, but the point is, it's getting better and better. And some people, the early adopters, the risk takers, they're um, you know, willing to, to start using it. The reality is, it's done when it's done, or it's ready when it's ready. Um, we have a stretch goal. Uh, is to release by DrupalCon Barcelona. Um, I don't know if that will be possible. As I said, it's a stretch goal. I know it will not be possible without the help of more people. Um, it will not be possible without the help of more people. We have an amazing team of people that have been working on Drupal 8 every, every day for weeks, for months, and we cannot ask, to do, we cannot ask them to do more. And so it's really important that more people get involved if we want to make uh, that stretch goal. And this is just the top 10 contributors. So how can you help? Well, there's you know, many ways you can help. Um, you can start porting modules. If you're an owner of a Drupal company, you can let your people contribute. Give them time to contribute. You know, attend the sprints. We'll have sprints here at DrupalCon. It's a great way to get involved and to learn how you can make a difference to Drupal 8. You can donate to Drupal 8. If you don't have the expertise, if you don't have the time, but you have the money, donate, and we'll make sure we spend the money to accelerate Drupal 8 and to pay the people that can. And obviously, you can try Drupal and you know, test it and report bugs. Um, 
Where exactly are we? Well, there's 28 critical bugs left today. Maybe it's this, I created this slide um, two days ago. So it may be inaccurate at this point, but it's around 28, if not 28. And so you can see we've made some good progress, um, but we still have 28 bugs left. Once we get to zero, um, you know, we'll start doing release candidates and hopefully um, you know, there will be a big party. So, Drupal 8, we've had a lot of people contribute. More than 2,800 people contributed, which is about three times the number of people that contributed to Drupal 7 core. Um, and you know, I'd like to thank all of these people that contributed to Drupal, not just to Drupal 8, people that contributed in the past, some of which have left us, uh, and the ones that are here today um, you know, working on Drupal 8. Thank you.